Well, amen, y'all. How's everybody? Good deal. Everybody start losing weight yet? Thank you for your prayers last week. If anybody prayed while I was trying to combat Montezuma's revenge, uh, I won't give you any details to it, but it was pretty stinking rough. Uh, if you've gone through Montezuma's revenge, let's just pray that he'll hold off another year. Um, I tell you what started it, and it really goes along good what I'm talking about this morning, and so I think it may be worth telling you. You ever eat too much of something and you wish you hadn't? You know what I'm talking about? And I'm not talking about like goods. You know, like we don't ever binge on like carrots and junk. You know what I'm talking about? It's just something about the human body. If you do, praise the Lord for you, and you're probably in a whole lot better shape than us that couldn't run from here to the back door without giving way. But we don't binge on stuff we ought to binge on. You know, we ought to binge on like apples, carrots, you know, the stuff that critters eat. You know what I'm talking about? That's, we, that's how we ought to binge whenever we need some comfort food. But a comfort food ain't no stick of celery, right? Comfort food is going to be junk that we ought not eat, but then it doesn't give us comfort on the backside. You know what I'm talking about? Take it however you want to, all right? But it does not give us comfort. And so this deal started with a big old pail, okay, was in Pigeon Forge right after New Year's, and uh, right at New Year's, and I, I bought a big old pail at this candy store down there on the island, down there at Pigeon Forge, of caramel chocolate popcorn. Y'all, I hear you. Praise the Jesus for that, right? You know what I'm talking about. I had that thing. And we're walking around just enjoying, it's New Year's Eve, and we're just enjoying our family and stuff and walking around. Already had a big meal already and didn't need anything else, but I wanted it. You understand the difference between need and want, right? And so I'm just popping this popcorn, and we, we get done what we're doing, and then we go back to our camper. We'd pulled our camper up there to stay, and I'm sitting at the camper, and kids is playing, you know, and whatever, and I'm just sitting there just eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. And that's where it all started, y'all. I ate that and just felt sick about it. You ever just eat something and you feel gross about yourself? You know? I mean, and I, some of the men won't admit this, but sometimes you just eat and eat and eat and eat to where you just, I don't know how to explain it other than say you feel dirty. You know? You feel kind of cheap after it's over with. You're just nasty feeling. And uh, I, that's the way I did with that old popcorn. I'll just be honest. The next day, you know, some of the kids, like, wanted to break it out, and I was just, ah, oh, nah. That ties in real well with what we're talking about this morning. So just keep that old nastiness of the story that I told you about and turn your Bibles to, Matt, uh, to John chapter 6. And as you're turning to John chapter 6, uh, over the next seven weeks, so six weeks after today, uh, we're going to look at the I Am statements that Jesus made of himself, of what he said in the book of John in terms of I am. And these statements, guys, these statements are way out there unless you are God, okay? Uh, Jesus, C.S. Lewis said that Jesus was one of three things. He was either a liar, which means everything that Jesus ever said is a complete fabrication. Every account that we have within the gospel is absolutely false. This guy was lying for whatever reason. He had some issues, but he lied all the way until he was crucified on the cross. So he's either one, a liar. Two, he was a lunatic, man. Jesus was evidently some sort of, of, of nut out there. He didn't have any validity. He just evidently cared so much about his craziness that he ended up enduring the cross. So he's, C.S. Lewis said he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. And guys, here at Thousand Hills Cowboy Church, we believe without a shadow of a doubt, he is Lord. And we also believe at Thousand Hills Cowboy Church to whether or not we ever believe or not he is Lord, he is still Lord. And I'll tell you right now, it hurts your feelings as an American, but I'll tell you right now, if none of you ever believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is who he says he is and he's done what he said he's done, it does not make a hill of beans in the grand scheme of things. He will still be Lord. Do you understand that? We don't like to hear that. I don't like to hear that. And I want you to realize that this morning, 
is that so many times we focus on the temporal instead of focusing on the eternal. Elliot already spoke it very well when he talked about the football game tomorrow night. I know who I want to lose, Gabe. But I don't give a rip who wins. I just know who I want to lose. But I'll be honest with you, in, unless, unless you're pulling, okay, and I'm, I'm sure the Crimson Tide going gonna to wear them out, but listen, unless you're a Crimson Tide fan and they win tomorrow night, you ain't going to remember that. You don't give a rip. I could care less. I can tell you the last time Tennessee had a national championship was 1998. T. Martin was a quarterback. Because I'm a Tennessee fan, a lot of you all too. You remember 1998. But guess what? Anybody that's not a Tennessee fan, they don't give a rip. They could care less. Right now, I'm just wasting their time by talking about it. Because so many times we get jacked up, don't we, on things that don't last. We don't get jacked up about the things that have a permanent consequence. Permanent results. Folks, everything that we do as a church, as a whole, this church over here and that church together collectively, everything that we do to advance the gospel message of Jesus Christ is permanent. It lasts forever. Every time you share the message of the gospel, every time you talk about Jesus in your workplace, every time you, you sit down with your kids and you pray with them and you show them the things of the Bible, those things are permanent and they keep giving and giving and giving and giving for eternity until Jesus comes back. Man, isn't that something? It's a heritage we're passing down, a legacy, if you will. And as a church, we've got to be about that. As a people, we have got to be about that and concentrate on the permanent, the eternal, the forever, and quit worrying so much about the temporal. As we look at this, uh, this, this series over the, last, over the next seven weeks, I want you to keep in mind John 8.58. And it's not here in our focal text, but you can write it down if you're taking notes. Jesus made this statement, which is as bold as any statement Jesus has ever made, when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus, in that moment, told every listener that was around, before Abraham was even born, I was already here. I was already doing my thing. I wasn't here on this earth yet physically, but I was here. And we see God's pre, we see Jesus's pre-existence alongside God all the way back to the book of Genesis. But that's a huge claim. He pre-existed before Abraham. And at that point in scriptures, of course, we know if we read on the Jews pick up stones, man, they're going to stone him. Of course, he gets out of there. Because claiming to be God was blasphemy, and blasphemy was a capital crime, and that means that you had to die, and they threw stones at you, rocks at you, until basically you were dead, which is not a good way to go. I've never been there, but I don't want to. But it reminds me of Exodus chapter 3, where Moses has the encounter with God through a burning bush. Do you remember this? Basically, what happens is, is God says to Moses, I've seen what the Egyptians are doing to my people. I've heard their prayers. I've heard their cries. Now I want to send you Moses. And Moses says, well, whenever I get there and I say that you've sent me, what is it that I need to tell them your name is? And listen to this answer. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13, it'll be on your screen, it says, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord 
the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. That day, Moses heard what no human ears had ever heard before in the history of the world. Right then and there, God spoke his name, and his name was what? I am. This is important to remember in light of Scripture, and especially the Scriptures we're going to be reading over the next seven weeks. So, with God's name being I am, or, or literally his name is B, which means he just is, we get something that maybe kind of we don't really understand, but there's one thing you do need to understand in this. That day, Moses found out God's name is I am, but Moses also found, he found out that day what his name is. You know what it is? I am not. God's name is I am, and guess what your name is? I am not. I am not the creator of the universe. I'm not the center of the show. I am not God. I'm not Savior. I am not. And if we live our lives with that type of attitude, we'd be a whole lot better off. Do you know that? If we would recognize that I am not. And throughout the book of John, Jesus makes some of these statements that we're going to be talking about. And the first one we're going to talk about today is, is when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And then we're going to look at, I am the light of the world, and I am the door, and I am the good shepherd, and I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. So this morning, let's look at this first I am statement that Jesus makes about himself in John chapter 6, and let's look at verse 48 first. Pretty simple, isn't it? I am the bread of life. Now, how many people went out, because it's interesting Jesus calls himself the bread of life, but how many people went out because of that huge snow we got last night? How many people went out and got bread and milk yesterday? Nobody wants to raise their hand. Come on now. What's the first thing we do in southern middle Tennessee when there's a winter weather advisory? That's exactly because we don't know what's going to happen, and the first thing you've got to have is a bread and milk combination for whatever that is. That's the first thing we think about. We go out and buy it, and, of course, we don't eat it at all with the snow going on or anything else. You know, electricity didn't go out, so we do other things. But in your mind, you're thinking electricity's going out. It's going to be not really a snow deal that we got, but it's going to be an ice deal because of where we live. It's going to be a mess, but you dang sure better not run out of bread and milk. It's important. And you show up at Dollar General or uh, Walmart or Kroger or whatever else, and you get there, and it looks like it's like the end of the world is coming, right? It's like they forecasted, look, there's, this, this is it for everybody, okay? So get what you can get now, but you go to the bread aisle, and the only thing that's left is that high-dollar expensive stuff that's good for you that nobody wants to eat. Am I, right? Am I right? I mean, bunny bread's done gone, brother. You know what I'm talking about? It's out. And all the high-dollar, high-priced milk is the only thing that's left. But we get jacked up, and, and, and the reason why we do is is because we need to make sure that we've got enough provision in case there does something does happen, electricity does go out, heaven forbid Walmart shut down for a day other than Christmas, and you know we got to make sure that we can feed one another because today I may have something to eat, but tomorrow I'm going to be hungry again, right? we got to get this sucker figured out. And that's human nature. That's the way you were created. And so when we look to Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. And by the way, yes, he is using the exact same wording that God used to Moses when he said, I am who I am. Jesus is saying the exact same thing. I am, yes the bread of life. It's pretty interesting, though, when you think about it as far as a metaphor, because if you just do a quick search of the Gospels, you can see real quickly, you find verses like Matthew 4.4, 4, if you're taking notes. It just simply says, 
when it tells the story when Jesus was responding to the devil in the wilderness for those 40 days and he was hungry because he was flesh so he was man he was 100% God 100% man at the exact same time and 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 the devil old devil said turn that rock into bread what did Jesus respond to he responded back with scripture and he said man does not live on bread alone but every word that comes or proceeds from the mouth of God we see it in the Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11, Jesus said when he's telling us how to pray, pray like this, give us this day our daily bread. So we see and we're encouraged to pray for our, our daily uh, uh, needs. And, and bread represents our basic daily needs. We've got to eat. How many of y'all ate last Sunday? But you ain't ate since. You know, unless you're praying and fasting, you ate yesterday. You may have ate a little biscuit this morning. Maybe you're planning on a big lunch with your family. But I guarantee you if we were to do a poll and say, okay, how many of y'all didn't eat it except for right after church last Sunday? It probably wouldn't be too good of a percentage, would it? Everybody and their mamas probably eat something. A biscuit, a sandwich, something. We've all. Why? Because that's what we do. It's human nature. We get hungry. We eat something. Sometimes we eat things that are good for us. Sometimes we eat some things that's not so good for us. Sometimes we feel good about what we ate. Sometimes we feel terrible that we ate that. And it makes us sick. Right before his death, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus used bread as an illustration about what he was about to do as he endured the cross. And he told him, he said, he, he, he said he, he, it, the Bible said he broke the bread and he gave thanks for it. And he says, this is my body that is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Bread is a powerful metaphor that we need to survive for or survive with in life. We've got to have something to eat. We've got to have some sort of sustenance to eat. When you look back in, in, in verses like uh, Matthew chapter 5 and you see Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. And the question I think that's key this morning for every single person in this room, what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? Four. Jesus said right here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 that if we hunger for the right things in this life, we'll be filled. If we hunger for the things of God, we will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be, uh, they will be filled. But so many times we hunger and thirst for things that don't fill us, don't we? Don't we? It's like going to the China buffet. It's $12.99 or $9.99, and it's all you can eat. And so you get in there, and you try to get it done, son, for the money. And you walk away, and you go, oh, I am one nasty sucker. You laugh because it's true. Or you're hungry and where you probably need to eat a can of tuna fish and some tomatoes or something, you pop open a, a bag of ho-hos, <laughs> Twinkies, right? Oh, no. oh, man, what have I done? You see why, you see why food is a powerful metaphor for life? Because how many times have you and me collectively needed to feed on the things that would give us sustenance and energy and make us feel good about ourselves in life, hunger and thirst for righteousness, what it is God said, but instead we're on a steady diet of Twinkies and Ho-Hos. Yeah, I watched a movie documentary 10 years ago called Super Size Me. Anybody catch that one? You catch that one's freaky, man. But this guy is doing a documentary, and he, like, for 30 days, all he eats is food off McDonald's. 
right? And I don't do McDonald's, but for if you work there, I'm not trying to, like, take your job or nothing. They'll continue on. But he eats for, like, 30 days, and he gains, like, I don't know, 30 or 40 pounds, and he's just sick and just weak and doesn't have any energy to do nothing. And, I mean, he's just... I mean, it just totally kind of wrecks him out, and his health just goes from being like this to... (coughs) And I think about that on the spiritual side. And I think that's what Jesus is communicating to us by saying, I am the bread of life. Because we live our spiritual lives on a bunch of Twinkies and McDonald's French fries and Ho-Hos, and then expect... That's how we live. We throw in all the junk, and then we expect to be able to live the Christian life like God's calling us to, and we're failing at it. I guarantee you, if you're going to be a world-class athlete, you're probably going to stay away from as many Twinkies and Ho-Hos and uh, fries as you can. You're going to eat some things that's got some protein, some sustenance to it. You're going to make sure that you're watching your diet and exercising regularly because even if you are a world-class athlete that's 100 pounds overweight, you can't run from here to the back of this building without heave-ho and nobody's going to want you. And so when you think about what Jesus is saying, and the key question for us is to ask, what are you hungry for? Are you hungry? And this is where a lot of people, a lot of Christians get it. And this is going to burn you a little bit. A lot of people are hungry for God's provision, what God can do for you, but they're not hungry for the person of God. They're hungry for what Jesus can do for them, but they're not hungry for Jesus himself. They want to praise God for what it is he's done, but they don't want to praise God for who he is. Are you hungry for his provision or are you hungry for his person? It seems that most people are hungry for God's provision. But when there's a time that we have a struggle, when there's a time that we have a need, whenever we're not getting the provision in a way that we think we ought to, the first thing we do is throw our hands up and we say, Why, God? Why am I going through this? Why is this like the way that it is? And see, Jesus he was, he was saying this, I am the bread of life, right off of the heels of feeding 5,000 men plus their wives plus their families. So you got to understand the context of what he's saying right here. And so he had all of these people following him. He had met the provision, and they had seen God work, Jesus work, in a, a, a powerful, unexplainable way. Everybody, the Bible says, everybody had their fill of fish and bread, There were 12 baskets left over that were full. There was plenty. And he told them that they were following him because he satisfied them physically. But there was so much more that Jesus wanted to do in their life. Do you hear me, folks? Let's look at the verse, verse 26. Jesus answered answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, You seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Jesus was saying that we hunger and we work for food that perishes. But we should hunger and work for food that lasts forever, that is eternal. That food comes from Jesus himself, y'all. Look at verse 30. It says, so they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of the heaven to eat. And Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you, listen to this, the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. He's talking of himself. Jesus recounts, just like the people recounted, of what happened on how the Israelites, when they were being led out of the wilderness by Moses, how they were fed. Bread would come from the sky each day, and it would give them a daily provision. Anytime they tried to hold it back, it would ruin and not be ready for the next day. 
It was a one-day provision, period. In the same way, God sent Jesus to be true bread from heaven that never spoils, that never wears out, that never gets moldy, y'all. Look at verse 34. They said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am, listen, he's saying again, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Jesus, the bread of life, the only begotten of God, is there, right there, face to face, breath to breath, y'all, eyeball to eyeball, standing before them, and they still don't believe. And later on in the passage, Jesus lets them know that they have to take into themselves the provision of Jesus. Uh, Not only take in the provision of Jesus, but take in the person of Jesus. And you see, I think that's where a lot of people miss it. They look for the provision, but they don't look for the person. Look at uh, verse 48. (coughs) He says again, I am the bread of life. Your fathers, they ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Now there are some folks that misinterpret this and believe when we take the Lord's Supper that literally that bread turns into the flesh of God and or Jesus and that the wine or the juice literally turns into the blood. That's hogwash. That don't make no sense at all. That's not what he's talking about at all. Let's not miss what Jesus is meaning right here, guys. For eternal life, for you and I to be saved, we have to take the person of Jesus into our lives. Does does that make sense? We've got to take the person of Jesus into our lives. We've got to be full on, guys. We find about who it is God is and what it is that he wants us to be, but we have got to be all in. The scriptures tell us that we are in him and that he is in the Father. We're covered up in him, y'all. So today, I ask you, do you hunger after God's provision or do you hunger after God's person? Are you interested in Jesus? Are you interested in what Jesus can do for you? Another question that we've got to ask ourselves is, are you hungry for the temporary or are you hungry for the eternal? Does the here and the now matter to you or does the forever matter to you? We get to talking about from time to time, and you've heard me say it and and try not to be morbid or one day. But one day I won't be the pastor of this church. Two generations from now, if Jesus don't come back, they won't even know me as the pastor of this church. They won't have no idea. And guess what? They won't give a rip. That may not pain you, but that pains me a little bit. I think about my children's children's children. They probably won't even know my first name. It's true. I'll be just a spot in Ancestry.com. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) They'll say, who was that dude? I I don't know. Some some dude that was our great-granddaddy or great-great-granddaddy, whatever. And when you think about it, it, it ought to blow your mind just a little bit. So the question that I ask myself is this. What is it that I am doing today in, my fam- in the life of my family and in the life of our church and in the life that God has called me to live as a believer? What is it that I am doing today that will have eternal significance? What is it 
What heritage, what legacy, what is it that I can pass on to my children that they can pass on to their children and so on and so forth. And while somebody may not know my name or exactly, exactly who I was, they will benefit off of the eternal instead of the temporal. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense to me. And in my human mind, I don't really like the idea of somebody forgetting who I am. But I realize it's inevitable. I don't know the first, I know the last names, but I don't know the first names of my great-great-grandparents. Maybe you do and you're a better person than I am, but I'd say most of you don't either. You kind of know some last names, but you done forgot about them people. You don't know where they're from. Unless you've signed up on some sort of website and you're into all that old stuff. But I'm not. You know why? They're dead. What, I mean, what are they going to do for me? I got stuff to do to then be sitting there typing up all that old stuff. And now if you're into that, I don't mean to offend you, but to me it's a waste of time. You know what I'm saying? I got seven to take care of right now. Six counting me. Ann takes care of me, so I guess I got five to take care of. Are you hungry for the temporary or are you hungry for the eternal? I think this is a valid question, especially in today's culture. You know, we chase the temporary all the time. We chase... Uh, fame, we chase fortune, we chase hobbies, we get more money, and what do we need? More money, all right? We fall in love, and then guess what? It don't work out like we want to, so we fall out of love, they fall back in love with somebody else. We take up a hobby, and then it gets kind of boring, and we spend all this money, it's laying over here in the corner, we need to put it on eBay, right? We chase all these things, talked a little bit about two weeks ago, as far as idols, we chase all these things, but eventually they lose their luster, and what should have made us happy don't make us all that happy no more. Am I right? Yeah, I'm right. We're never content. The grass is always greener on the other side. You, you know what I'm talking about. Look at verse 43. Jesus answered, said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. And it's written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. And truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus draws again from their ancestors in the desert. They ate manna that was daily provided and guess what happens they die does everybody realize they're going to die here unless Jesus comes back for you between now and then one day you will die and guess what one day you will be forgotten what is it that you are doing today that will live forever the things that you do in Jesus name the ministry that you do, the investment that you invest in other people with the message of the gospel, your family, your friends, those that you work with. The children of Israel had that daily provision, but it only lasted one day. Jesus is saying that he is the bread of heaven. We need to take hold of him because he will last forever. And in doing so, you'll never die. You'll never die. The old physical body will wear out. It'll be gone. But you will live eternally who you are, the very essence of who you are, your soul with Jesus. True satisfaction and true everlasting life is found on focusing on the eternal things, bread that don't mold. So this morning I ask you, are you hungry for the temporary, or are you hungry for the eternal? Where are you at? Where do you stand before a holy God this morning? I want to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes a minute. Nothing spiritual about doing that, <clears throat> but as I close, some of you need to do business with God. You've been focusing on things that really don't matter, 
in this old world. You've been chasing a lot of things that are that are right here and the right now. They are temporal. Uh, one day they'll be gone, and you will too. But you ain't done business on the eternal side of things. Let me tell you what. Today, get right with God. Get right with God. As the Holy Spirit of God draws you, and we already seen that from our text today, unless the Holy Spirit of God draws you, unless God draws you himself, you can't even be saved. And so today, as God draws you and moves in on you today, it's time to answer that call. It's time to recognize that Jesus is who he says he is. He is the bread of life, folks. And I'm going to tell you, when you are in him, you got something. You got something. And the things that we do in his name and what it is that he's called us to do to tell others about the message of the gospel and how they can be saved, those are the things that will last. Those are the things that you can take with you and you will take with you. The hearts and lives that have been changed directly as a result of God using you, those last forever. What are you doing today? Are you investing where you need to be investing? Are you sharing the message of the gospel with your family? Are you sitting down with your kids and teaching them how to pray, teaching them how to study the Word of God? Man, I'm failing on that part myself, but we're trying to work towards it. Are you investing in the lives of the people that are closest around you? Men, are you standing up where you need to stand up and leading your families? Are you telling coworkers about Jesus? Are you doing everything that you can to make an eternal impact, guys? Because that is the only thing that will last in this world. Maybe this morning you need to get things right with God. There's going to be some guys that will be down front here as everybody walks out and tries to get to the China buffet because I made them hungry. There's going to be some guys down here at the steps that would love to talk to you about making an eternal decision and following Jesus. You know, the greatest thing that you will ever do is recognize your need for a Savior and follow Him all the rest of your days. This morning, if there needs to be some clarity, you got some questions, you need prayer, you got some family that needs some prayer, you want to find out what it means to take the first step of discipleship in baptism or church membership or whatever, they'll be here to talk to you and answer any questions that you have. I'm going to pray with you. We're going to get you going. Lord, thank you. Thank you. God, thank you for being. Thank you for being the bread of life, Lord God. Thank you, God, that we don't have to fill up on things that don't satisfy. We can fill up on you that we can read your word, that we can fill up on your word, Lord, to feed us in this old world that we live in. Thank you, God, for calling us out of darkness into light. Use us, Lord Jesus, in that. And, Lord, I pray that we would bank on, that we would trust in the things of you this week. Ignite a fire in this church, in our county, in our world, that all Christians would stand up and would have their voices heard with the message of the gospel. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.